Right, first stop has to be the Ferrari stand. Always a crowd puller at the motor show. Super expensive, super exclusive and super glamorous. Don't you just love them? When Ford snapped up Aston Martin, they wanted to create a British Ferrari and they're banking on their next model to do the job. It's so new, it's not even here. But Jason's tracked one down, so for the first time ever on British television, the future of Aston Martin. Do you remember when James Bond wouldn't be seen dead in anything but an Aston Martin? Well, there are rumours of him stepping back into one for the next movie. But which one? Pierce Brosnan's already been seen in the DB5, so how about the DB7 Vantage? Or most likely, the company's latest offering. Aston Martin have a habit of starting all their model names with the letter V, and surely now they must be struggling to come up with good ones. Let's think we've had the Virage, the Vantage, the Valiant, the Vicarage, the Viagra. However, they've hit the nail on the head with this one. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the new Vanquish V12. <laughs> Great name, but I wonder if it get the stains out my carpet. Whatever you think of the name, this car is set to be the most high-tech Aston Martin ever. Way more advanced than the DB5 with the ejector seat. This is the car that parent company Ford will be using as a technology showcase for future models. This should be available late next year, just in time for Bond's next outing. Don't touch that 007. The new Vanquish is being built here in Kew's secret laboratory in Newport Pagnell using groundbreaking composite construction techniques. It's so hush-hush that for now, only 50 prototypes exist. And this is one of them, and I've got to say it is a beautiful beast. It's the most modern looking Aston Martin yet, but it's got some subtle retro touches. Hang on. Haven't I seen those window switches on a Ford Focus? Well, Aston assures us that most of the switch gear won't be nicked from Ford's parts bin. Exterior styling keeps the look of the modern Aston Martin family, but the beautiful sculpted nose is more reminiscent of a Ferrari 550 Marinello. And on the Ferrari theme, the new Vanquish will be available with either a Formula One paddle shift gear change or straight automatic. There will be no traditional manual version. might be smooth, but this car should be scary to drive. 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds and 190 miles an hour top speed. It looks like Ferrari will have some stiff competition on their hands. But where they differ is on cost. The Vanquish V12 will start at a staggering £170,000, topping off at 200 grand, and that's 50k more than the Ferrari. The Vanquish looks like being a screaming success with its lovely 450 horsepower V12, its revolutionary construction and its gorgeous styling. I reckon Aston Martin will have no problem shifting these even at 200 grand a piece. One of the stars of this year's show is the new Mini. It's over there but getting a glimpse of it ain't going to be easy. The only a truly effective way to get onto these busy stands is to employ some guerrilla tactics. Come on, follow me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Lucky for you lot, we've done all the hard work, so sit back, relax and enjoy the hottest cars from the show. The new Mini was mobbed at the Paris Motor Show two weeks ago, and it's happening again. It's in Hall 6, miles away from the main entrance, but worth a first stop. Prices start at 10 grand next summer, and you can place an order at the show. Stick around in six for BMW's other show debut, the M3, on sale next March at a cool 38 grand. And not so far away, Ferrari's fabulous 550 Barchetta, built to celebrate 70 years of their fave stylist, Pin and Farina. There's a get you home hood or get the servants to run behind you. Right, backtrack to Hall 4, grab a coffee and enjoy the Mondeo Fest. More of that later. Hall 4 is full of the happy Ford family, including posher brands like Volvo with its new S60. Mosey back to Hall 3 or run if you want to catch a clear shot of seeing the amazing Porsche Carrera GT supercar. 
and then back to one for the new Alfa Romeo 147. Proven that at last, Alfa Romeo hatchbacks are looking cool. Full details of the show, prices, admission times and highlights are all on our website. Plus, hot from Italy, a road test of Alfa Romeo's sexy 147. It's all on 4car.co.uk. Well, they're all here, Ford, Honda, Skoda, Reliant, Subaru, Toyota, but there's one company missing, Rover. Last month's sales were down, but even so, isn't it a bit odd that Rover aren't here to play a match on their home ground? Well, perhaps not. The new Rover boss, John Towers, is reported to have said, and I quote, that motor shows are primarily for the benefit of motoring journalists and school children, neither of whom buy cars. Hmm, so what is going on under the cover at Rover? Well, I was let into a bit of a secret. In the post-war years, to own a Rover became more and more a desirable objective. Once a driver had owned a Rover, it raised his appreciation of what pleasure and satisfaction such a good car could give. Ah, the halcyon days of Rover's golden era. But back to the present and owning a Rover is seemingly not what it was. The beleaguered British company bought and sold by BMW has just waved goodbye to the Mini and rebranded itself MG Rover, banking that the MG name still has an attractive image. But it's going to need a damn good product to back it up. And the man charged with pulling off this minor miracle is former Driven presenter, the genius behind the Lotus Esprit and the McLaren F1 road car. Peter Stevens is the new head of design at MG Rover and he's let Driven into the secret design studio that houses a car that could be the answer to all the company's problems. So what's under the dust sheet, Peter? Whoa, there's no way that we're going to show you. No, no. Peter has to be careful about what he says, so we've added some useful subtitles to tell you what we think. Well, it's cool, there's a car under there. There, I've given it away. The stance of it it's going to be pretty dramatic. It's going to be quite ground-hugging. It's going to have serious wheels and tyres. It's going to have some aerodynamic development on it, but that isn't going to be what I'd call surface entertainment. You know, I believe that if you're doing aero bits, you should only do those because they add to the performance of the car. We'd like to do very dramatic sports cars. I mean, one of the things we're doing is going to Le Mans in 2001. And that's the kind of pinnacle of where we would imagine ourselves being with sports cars. So we'll step down a little bit from that for production ones, but not a lot, I hope. MGs have got to have what I call outside lane credibility. I think they've got to be able to take their place in the fast lane along with the kind of marks which see it as their right to be out there. I think, I mean, this car is going to demonstrate that really well that suddenly we've had an opportunity to do the kind of cars that we passionately believe in. Well, it all sounds very exciting, Peter, but even BMW couldn't make Rover work. So can new owners Phoenix carry out their pledge to keep Rover a volume manufacturer? We asked Dr. Chris Brady, a Rover expert, to rate their chances. Rover's strategy with MG, I think, is very sound. What they're going to do is they're going to boost up the engines, they've got a terrific design team in place, they're going to really work to push the MG mark. Whether Rover will live or die is the question that everybody wants to know. The reality of the fact is that once BMW sold Rover, Rover died as the way in which we always know it. It can only now be a niche market and an MG, that's all that's left. So whether it'll live or die, it's going to die. This whole exercise that we're involved with is tremendously important to Rover. It's a fascinating experiment to see if we can make a medium-sized car company successful. You know? And I think we can, but I'm sure we can. This MG saloon certainly looks like it's going to be sporty, even under the dust sheet. But is it enough to save MG Rover? We hope so, but only time will tell. Rover isn't the only company to go down the niche manufacturing route. It's a buzzword at the moment, and in the face of the consolidation that's gone on over the last few years, maybe the only hope is for small and medium-sized car manufacturers. Niche marketing is something us Brits are very good at. We do a roaring trade in low-volume sports cars like these. There's plenty to see at the show, and here are some of our favourites. 
After several show outings, the new Jensen SBA is finally being delivered to its first owners, alongside the soft top and new coupe. The intense motorbike engine Strathcarran SC is aimed at track day fans. And good grief, a new Morgan with a BMW engine is nothing sacred. But one maker's top of the independent tree, and they always manage to whip up a new car or two for the show. Sussed it yet? Ah, Blackpool, the Riviera of the Northwest, and home to TVR, founded by Trevor Wilkinson in 1947. TVR handmade supercar alternatives, popular with rugby club maniacs or the seriously hardcore. This is their prototype, Tamora, an entry-level car which will be built to replace the Griffith. But it won't be ready until next spring. Until then, you'll have to make do with this year's cars. Take a ride. latest offering from TVR, the Tuscan, with its own engine built straight out of the factory. It's a speed six, four litre, so it's a bit like Marinello and Enzo Ferrari, all built in-house. But this one, lad, is built in Blackpool by a bloke called Peter, Peter Wheeler. TVR have raised the price of the Tuscan by nine grand to just under 50. These days, that's brave. Their reasoning, you now get sport suspension, air con, and a digital radio as standard. Maybe they got the pricing wrong in the first place, or they're just supremely confident. The burning question is, is it worth it? The Tuscan is lightweight with a huge amount of power, and there's no driver's aid whatsoever. No electronic gizmos, no traction control, no ABS. In fact, the only driver's aid they say you need is a progressive chassis. So this car has got 360 brake horsepower screaming through the rear wheels which means it could be fun for some, but absolutely lethal for others. All right, so the TVR Tuscan does crash and bang over bumps a little bit. In fact, running over a Rizzler feels like you just run over a sheep. But what do you expect? This is a race car for the road. There are a few things every self-respecting TVR driver must have. Firstly, you're going to need blind courage. Secondly, oh yeah, you're going to need a rugger shirt so you can join a Twickenham set. And thirdly, you're going to need a hairdryer so you can blow dry the tarmac in front of you if it's a wet day. TVR say they plan to take on the lights of Jaguar, but I don't think that's realistic. This is a hand-built, bare essentials, high-maintenance sports car, not really suitable for everyday use. It's one for the enthusiast. It's out here in open space on a racetrack that the TVR Tuscan really comes into its own. It delivers the 360 brake horsepower through the rear wheels effortlessly when it's hooked up to this great little five-speed gearbox that slots home into gear neatly and precisely. Now on the road, this car barely has power steering, but I can understand why, because when you're on the track, it loads up beautifully into tight corners and S-bends. There are a few flaws with it though, and they are wind noise, it rattles around a bit, but I can live with these because it comes from a manufacturer that hand makes sports cars. So far, TVR have managed to deliver 500 Tuscans with a further 1,100 orders to go. But if you want to order one now, you'll have to pay the increased price. The TVR Tuscan is a true British creation. It's a pint as opposed to a cocktail. It's raw, eccentric and overconfident if a little rough around the edges, which I suppose is a fair representation of what we do well. But is it worth nearly 50 grand of my money? Well, I think so, but I still have another problem with it. How can it compete with names like Lamborghini, Porsche, Ferrari, when the brand name and badge TVR actually stand for Trevor? But old Tricky Trevi's done well this time because this is the brand new TVR Tamora. Now, the paint's still a little bit wet on this car. It's priced at around £35,000, which puts it in the same league as the Porsche Boxster. So that's next season's cars. What about this season's fashions? And let me tell you, the Mini is definitely out. Get it? And now, Driven's car fashion tips for this autumn. No more floppy hoods. Even small cars like this Peugeot will have folding hardtops and no boot. 
Off-roaders will be worn smaller this year from Nissan, Ford and Mazda. Even little cars will try to look like off-roaders. And here's a butch Audi coupe. Oh, a spare tire. Oh, doors, they're so last week. And gadgets. Tellies in headrests. Smart cards to start up. And his and hers armrest radios. Now, now. Coming up after the break, a big test for the big seller. And a TV first. The new Lotus Elise brakes cover. And where better to test out Vauxhall's latest offering? Because looking at the technical specifications, it's the biggest small car they've ever built. For example, it has safety features like active front head restraints. It has speed-sensitive power steering, athletic styling, a pedal release system, easy tronic gearbox. No, this can't be right. It's teeny. That will fit in my trunk. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> the all-new Corsa. The biggest small car we've ever built. Well, come on, it must be in the air somewhere. Luxor, raising the standard. Hey, Mike, this fame stuff's great now. I've had tea with Craig from Big Brother. Prime Minister said hello. It's just fantastic. Oi, 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 I've been working hard. And I've got friends too, you know. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have your of course you can. What's your name? Celeste. Yeah, this will do us, pal. Cheers, lovely. Uh, Jace, have you met the uh, Olympic gold medal okay. rowing team? Oh, do, do. Next up, the Driven 100. The new Mondeo is one of the most important cars at this year's motor show and Ford expect a lot from it. They want the new Mondeo to be the most desirable Repmobile ever. If they're going to achieve that, they're going to have to beat the likes of the stylish Peugeot 406. Whoa. Now a bit long in the tooth, but once drooled over in little chef car parks nationwide. And what about this blue-blooded Rover 75 with a touch of British class? It offers you something else to hang your Burton's jacket in. A staggering 8 out of 10 of these are sold to companies rather than private buyers. And this week's Driven 100 tests are specially tailored to the rep set. Later, we'll be rating overtaking ability and ride quality. And then it's crunch time in our desirability test. What will a gaggle of company car drivers make of the new Mondeo? But first, what are they like behind the wheel? Look a bit conservative, this new Mondeo. We would not be wrong because this car's going to go against the very sensible Volkswagen Passat, Europe's biggest seller. Now, they say that imitation is the best form of flattery, but interior-wise, at least, you'd think the Mondeo and the Passat were separated at birth. The shape of the dash, the air vents, the quality of the plastics, the whole feel of the car is really Germanic. How things have changed is the old Ford Cortina. Well, the Peugeot 406 hasn't changed much in four years, apart from a few tweaks at the front and at the rear. It used to be the car that set the standards that other executive saloons were judged by, but now it's beginning to show its age on the outside, and on the inside, it's just plain dull. Hard-wearing black plastic abounds, but for a car that's going to take an awful lot of knocks, ferrying you up and down the motorway, helping you to reach your sales targets, maybe that's not such a bad thing. I feel as if I should be smoking a pipe whilst driving this car. In front of me there's this wooden mantelpiece, uh, sorry, dashboard. There's the old-fashioned dials, some nice chrome touches, but what lets it down in my opinion is this horrible black plastic centre console. It's just so out of keeping with the rest of the car. 
Although Rover have had to use modern materials in their quest to recreate their glory days, they've done a good job. It's actually quite cosy in here. And you can be sure the nostalgia factor will always attract a few buyers. Sorry, can't stop and talk. Got a boot full of carpet samples. Presentation Bradford, four o'clock. Stupidly, I've stopped to pick up a couple of hitchhikers who are sending me around the twist with their stories about motor show pamphlets, carrier bags. What? I want to get some new stickers and, and, and some autographs and brochures. Big carrier bags with oh. big manufacturers blazing on the and side. Pamphlets, loads of pamphlets. <laughs> Stop behind this truck at 50 mile an hour. No! When you need to overtake and you're not sure if your motor's got the power to get you past it safely, look no further than our time exposed to danger test. This rates the ability of our cars to overtake slower moving vehicles safely within a limited distance. If they fail, not only do they take out some cones, but Jason might miss Carpet Sample Expo 2000. So first to go, we've got the all new Ford Mondeo. Regular package of two litre 16 valve with 145 horsepower. And it'll get to 60 in just over nine and a half seconds. It's the fastest of the three with a top speed of 134 miles an hour. Right, and we 15, might need it, Jay. Here we go. Go on, son, off we go. Tell you what. Come on, they're launching a new Ligier in all five. <laughs> quick, quick. <laughs> Come on, Jay, it's foot oh. down. Well, not bad at all. Easy. Really very good. Delivers the power just where you need it. Remember, these cars are going to spend most of their life hacking up and down motorways and needed to overtake big trucks like that, and it was perfect for that Did job. Did a brilliant job. Uh, next up, it's the Peugeot 406. So now we're in the Peugeot 406. Now this is the least powerful of the three, with 137 brake horsepower. I'm a little worried here. Yeah, and I'm afraid it's the slowest 0 to 60. It takes nearly 11 seconds. And just to be a little bit more glum, it's also got the slowest top speed, only 100 miles an hour. And 29 miles an hour. Come on, Jase, get your foot. We're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. <laughs> oh, we've heard this. Oh, We're never going to get the stickers on the Skoda stand now. <laughs> oh, no. So exactly what you don't want from a motorway hack, isn't it? You exactly. just want to be out of breeze past these big lorries. So the Peugeot 406 doesn't even rate a time exposed to danger because it had to use the escape lane. Let's see how the 75 does. So last of the three cars in our test is the Rover 75. Now this is a six cylinder, two litre engine, got the most power of the bunch at 148 brake horsepower. It's also got the best acceleration, 0 to 60 in nine and a half seconds. And we're going to need all of this as we go into the cones, top speed 130 oh, miles an hour. Oh, 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 it's it's close. Oh, I've heard this pamphlet all right. Oh. <laughs> quick, Get that quick. quick. I'll tell you what, we only just made that there. This is a tough test, but the Mondeo comes out on top, getting Jason to his four o'clock in Bradford. The Rover just makes it in second, but in the Peugeot, not only would Jason lose his job, but he'd also be bored to death by his half-wit hitchhikers. Later in the Driven 100, we'll see how well the Mondeo handles its drink. But now, back to the motor show. And now for the headlines. Top story, car pricing. We've seen a boom recently in imported cars. Websites backed by big names supplying cars straight to your door. And even retail dealers setting their own prices. The government ordered a 10% price cut in UK list prices earlier this year. Since then, buyers have stayed put and it's only been a matter of time before even the industry giants caved in. Our advice is to shop around and remember there's still room for haggling at your local dealer, especially now there's all these new family cars being launched. Good night. The Mondeo's hitting the streets alongside some tough competition. The Volkswagen Passat's getting a new face, fresh engines and a new bum next year. But if all that's too Germanic to bear, the Renault Laguna hatch or estate may be a bit more stylish. Citroen have ditched the XM and the Xantia in favour of the sober-sided C5. Underneath, trick suspension is promised. For compact families, the Honda Civic's squared up. And even smaller, the all-new but strangely familiar Vauxhall Corsa comes in many colours. So with all this new stuff coming soon, the last thing that dealers want is old stuff clogging up their car showrooms. 
So if you want to buy a new car at a knockdown price that's ready to roll, then look for the stuff that isn't here or on its last run out. It may not impress your neighbours, but I guarantee you'll get a car that's dripping with optional extras and at a bargain price. Are you ready? about these end-of-line bargains plus more good deals, visit all the w's.4car.co.uk. Lotus always managed to throw a few surprises at the motor show, and this time they surpass themselves. So, what's this year's proverbial rabbit from the hat? Well, it's not the M250. That's way off production. Oh no, the word hot off the Lotus Press is they're killing off the Elise. Now, just behind me, the new car's been unveiled for the first time, but we managed to get it last week. The Lotus Elise, the ultimate driver's car, uncompromising and true to Colin Chapman's ethic of lightweight, well-balanced sports cars. A race car for the road and a truly British one at that. The Elise championed the revival of Lotus's fortunes and became a bestseller. But alas, the Elise as we know it is dead. In a shock announcement last week, Lotus told the world that there's to be a completely new Elise. Now we're driven are prepared to go to any length to get you the latest spy shots. But this time we didn't have to go undercover because Lotus led us through the front gates and we were the first press to see the new car. Featuring an all new body, a more powerful engine and a tweaked chassis, the new Elise will go on sale next month at a price of £22,995. Gone are the curvy lines of the old car. Instead, a much more aggressive stance a lowered front and fatter rear to fit around the bigger back wheels. But the order books were full for the old car, so come on Lotus, if it's not broke then why fix it? Well, the old Elise has certainly been a very successful car for us, um, but things don't stand still and our engineers have been at work on new developments for cars over the last four or five years. And we felt it was time to pull them all into one place and make an even more exciting car for our customers. This new Elise is again powered by the Rover 1.8 K-Series engine. Power rises to 120 horsepower, which when coupled to the new close ratio gearbox gives a 0 to 60 time in 5.7 seconds. The new design aims to make the Elise easier to live with. A wider rear end gives a little more boot space and the sills have been lowered for easier access. The cabin is luxurious by Lotus standards and at last it's got custom made switch gear, not a Peugeot part in sight. But there could be a twist to this tale. You see, Vauxhall have just released a small two-seater sports car and who developed the VX220 and even built it? Lotus, of course. So are Lotus trying to pull a fast one? We believe that the Vauxhall and the Elise are very different cars. The uh, number of component shares is incredibly small. In fact, the, the main thing is the difference is uh, they carried different powertrains, different gearboxes, uh, different styling, different interiors, uh, and indeed, most importantly, different driving characteristics. We'll let you know if that's true when we get to drive it. But for now, here's a strange fact. For the first time ever, a sporty Vauxhall has got the same price tag as a Lotus. The Elise is dead. Long live the Elise. After the break, Jason gets excited about a Renault Clio and in the Driven 100, which of our company cars will be king of the office car park? activity vehicle. Welcome back to the Driven 100 Motor Show Special. Now, you have to agree that us Brits make fine beer, fine music and fine motor cars. Just take a look at the new Aston Martin and you'll know what I mean. But you have to admit that our current top of the pops in the Driven 100 is a car made over the water in France. 
However, not satisfied with the accolades we've poured on the Clio Sport, Renault have decided to send this Super Mini to a different planet. And this is it, the new Renault Sport Clio V6. Sport being the operative word, 0 to 60 in 6 seconds, top speed 150 miles an hour. And if size really doesn't matter, for 26 grand, this Clio should fulfill all your needs. It's based on the racing Clio that competes in an international one-make series. The race cars are a real handful, but Renault claimed to have tamed the beast with its road-going version. The first thing you notice about this car is there's no rear seats. Like its older cousin, the Renault 5 Turbo 2, the engine's mid-mounted supercar style. The chassis has been extensively modified to accommodate the V6 230 brake horsepower 3-litre engine, all driven through a brand new 6-speed gearbox. Now, all that sounds very exotic, but Renault are keen to stress that this is a usable, everyday car. It's aimed fairly and squarely at the enthusiast who enjoys some of the luxuries of life. Inside, the sports clear is all... There's a sea of leather on Alcantara. It's fully loaded with aircon and CD changer. It's got twin airbags. It's even got side airbags. In fact, it's so relaxing and serene, you forget that outside it's all... Where the engine used to be is now a small storage area, and where the rear passenger sat is now a rather large engine. The body shell, bonnet, roof and rear hatch are taken from the Clio, but all other body parts are new, like the outrageous side air intakes, making the Sport Clio reminiscent of the Renault 5 Turbo 2. This Clio was developed by Renault Sport in conjunction with TWR, the company that runs the Arrows Formula 1 team, so it's got the sporty credentials, but will it live up to the name? On appearance alone, this car looks like it's going to be a real handful, but it isn't. The chassis is great fun, the steering wheel, it's incredibly precise, almost pointy. Now on fast sweeping open roads, this car is just great fun. It's a joy to drive, it handles like a dream, and it goes like stink. The racing Clio is an absolute hooligan, and Renault have done a fine job in transforming it into this pocket supercar. It's got everything you need, apart from the boot space, of course. Originally, the Sport Clio was destined to have an extra 30 horsepower and weigh 300 kilograms less. It's a pity they never stuck to that. However, it was also going to cost you another five grand. So, at 26,000 pounds, I reckon you'd be hard pushed to find anything that can match its performance and its looks. It's absolutely wild. Right, time to get back to the Driven 100. So far, the new Mondeo is well in the lead after fairly beating the Rover 75 and the Peugeot 406 in our time exposure danger test. But if you're going to buy one of these and spend many hours in one, you want them to feel relaxed and comfortable. So it's time to find out just how refined they really are. When it comes to drinking a cup of coffee on the move, nobody does it better than your travelling sales rep. So it may come as a surprise to learn that this new Mondeo is the first one ever to have a cup holder on the dash. Which is rather handy for us in this ride quality test. We're going to put a cup of water in it and see how much spills out as we drive over a bumpy test track. Now Ford hope the Mondeo will set new standards in ride and comfort. Let's see what it's up against. In the Rover 75, we've got our beaker of water, our simulated cappuccino. Mike's going to tell us in the back how it feels, and Jason... I'm going to oh, get a wet leg, I think. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and we're going to drive at 20 miles an hour over a fairly bumpy surface. That's all right. That's all right. A little Don't even notice it in the back here. I tell you, I'm really comfy here. Yeah. I've got plenty of room, plenty of elbow room. Very nice. Now we're going to hit the slightly bumpier surface at 20 miles an hour. Oh dear. Oh, oh, there's some water. Oh, it's coming out. It, there's some water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jason, you're going to get soaked. This is very good. It's like sitting on the corner of a washing machine. <laughs> I've really been rattled around in the back. I quite enjoyed the vibrations, but I must admit I'm a bit damp now. I'm not happy with that. I've got the short straw here, haven't I? Yeah. yeah. Now it's the turn of the Peugeot 406. Now the cup holder this time is under my elbow, so you're going to have to tell me 
Don't worry. How much water I is spilling be. out? So 20 miles an hour onto the not so bumpy surface. It's quite good. I'm comfy here, like Mike. Nice what about you? The only thing is I feel a bit high. Was it like in the back? Yeah. Well, it's not bad at all. I haven't got the right support under leg, and yet again, it's a bench seat only built for two, although you can sit in the middle here. But um, yeah, I'm sitting well above the suspension. Here it goes. Is it going? Oh, oh, it's it's it. oh, it's off. It's off. <laughs> it's it's off. off. It's on the way. <laughs> Niagara. Oh, dear. So, how did we do? Not bad at all. Oh, I think that's better than the uh, than the Rover. Oh, it has done better. It's hardly lost anything. So next up, it'll be interesting to see how the Ford Mondeo does. Now Ford have promised improved ride quality, so we'll just have to see if it really is improved. So here we go, 20 miles an hour. Can I just say, guys, out of free, I've got absolutely acres of space in the back. I'm being supported in all the right places. Yet again, the seat is only built for two, like the other two cars, but you can get free in quite comfortably. Here we go, here's the bumpy stuff. Look at this. <gasps> Look at the difference. It's like a mill it's pod. just is amazing. Good. And sitting in the back here is fantastic. The ride quality oh, is, is absolutely superb. It is very, very, very impressive. By far, for me, guys, yeah. in the back, it was the most comfortable penny. Oh, well, as a driving experience, it's by far the best. And it just goes to show that the ride quality really has been improved because no water was spilt in here. Well done, Ford Mondeo. Not a drop of water lost, the first time that's ever happened on a driven ride quality test. Company car manufacturers take note. The Mondeo has just set new standards of refinement. It glides past the second place Peugeot and the slightly disappointing 75. In the daily battle for motorway supremacy, there's only one thing that's really important to company car drivers, and that's prestige. So which one of these three Repmobiles would you feel happy to be seen eating your service station sausage roll in? Well, these are the people to ask. A whole business complex full of the kind of employees that would be taking these cars to expos and trade fairs nationwide. And what better way to find out whether Ford really have made the new Mondeo a truly desirable car? The options list may be as long as your arm, but does the blue oval badge really have enough charisma to lord it up against the Parisian charm of the Peugeot or the period feel of the Rover? Well, let's find out. Come on in, you lot. Dig in. Have a good right, look round. Have a look round. Right, we've got three suits squeezed in the back here. Now, you all seem to have a, a little bit of leg room. What do you think of it in the back? It's, it's bigger than the other three. I mean, we've got a lot more headroom. Head yeah. head six quarters. Yeah. A lot of headroom. So Comfort. It's, yeah, comfortable it's, it's seat not seat bad. Seat. I mean, yeah. it's sitting in this river squashed in, it's quite, still quite comfy. I personally have never been an actual Ford fan. Um, I'm a Rover person, to be honest. But I must be honest, but Ford have definitely come up with, I think, a winner on this particular model. I feel the trim and the comfort factor is better in the Rover, but I'll still, still give this a, a yes for the for Ford. That's quite nice in here, isn't it? First impressions. Uh, very smart, nice trim. You like the styling? Yeah, yeah, very nice. You do really like this car, don't you? I must admit, I am sold on the Rover. If I'm looking at something practical, family, having children with you when you're travelling, I think this is brilliant. You've got everything in there. Yeah, bar the WC, everything else is there. Birmingham folk love Rovers. So what do you think? Uh, not so bad on the interior. I'm disappointed in the car itself because it's too much like a 405. It's just not very nice, really. Um, it's about as um, inspiring as a wet day in Birmingham. The image um, compared to the other two, the other two look a bit more modern. This is the same as it's always been. Yeah. So. So please, can we have a new Peugeot 406? Yeah. Agreed. A 407. <laughs> <laughs> So the average company car buyer has had a good look round all three of our cars, but which one are they going to vote for? Well, let's find out. Run around now. Come on, they're all the going to come to my form obviously. Oh, this is tight, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. How many more? How many more? Eleven. How many you, Pen? Well, hang on. Give me a chance to count <laughs> them all up. Uh, just the one. <laughs> And I've got 14. So new design, new edge, and a new prestige badge, because Ford wins it on desirability. To vote in the Driven 100, log on to fourcar.co.uk. We'll be announcing the viewers' car of 2000 on next week's show.
The Motor Show is car heaven. All these shiny new cars, lower prices and great variety to choose from. But behind all this glitz, the world's motor industry is going through its biggest ever shakedown. Good news for you? Uh, just an egg, please, Ant. OK. There you go, Jason. Thanks. Well, we're not sure. And to find out why, Penny wants us to play a game. OK, time for a game of Spot the Difference. Take this Skoda Octavia and this Audi A3, one very desirable and one not so chic. The superficial differences are obvious. Different badges, different body shapes and of course different prices. A whopping four grand in fact. But did you know that this Skoda and this Audi are essentially the same car? The reason for this is that there are fewer car makers. In the last few years, bigger car companies have been busy gobbling up smaller ones to increase their stake in the market. It has been said that before long, there will only be six major car manufacturers holding all the cards. At the moment, there are just four main players. Ford, GM, VW and Daimler Chrysler. GM have hopped into bed with Fiat and bought out the remaining stake in Saab. Ford have snapped up Land Rover. Daimler Chrysler have bought stakes in Asian car makers Hyundai and Mitsubishi. All this consolidation is simply about reducing manufacturing costs by using the same parts in a number of cars. And I'm not talking the occasional headlamp. I'm talking about this, the floor pan or platform, which includes engines, transmission, steering, suspension, all the oily bits. This doesn't just affect cheaper cars. Ford can afford to make this, next year's Baby Jag, because it shares its platform with the new Mondeo. Which brings us neatly back to our Audi and our Skoda, both part of the Volkswagen Golf family tree. <gasps> the Audi A3 shares a platform with the Skoda Octavia, which shares with the Golf, from which sprang the Audi TT, which begat the Seat Toledo and then the Seat Leon. Matched engine for engine, the drive won't be much different. In fact, apart from the body shape and the interior, they are essentially the same car. Let's do the maths again. A base Audi A3 1.6 costs £15,230. A Skoda Octavia 1.6 has two more doors, a bigger boot, but a lowly badge and costs £11,400. So is £4,170 really worth it for some Audi rings and a superior interior? So our advice to you is to learn your car family trees to avoid paying over the odds. And one more thing, if you think we've been ripped off with high car prices up till now, the pricing policies of six global car companies just doesn't bear thinking about. Car tell anyone? Now for the results of the Driven 100. So we've seen what's on offer inside the motor show, but now on the outside, we're going to make up our minds with our three executive saloons in the Driven 100. And we're going to start with the Peugeot and drivability. Yeah, I was thoroughly underwhelmed by this car. It wasn't exciting, it wasn't memorable, there was nothing about it that I particularly liked. I couldn't even get comfortable in it. So I think um, a fairly low score, I would go for 16. Okay. Well, on to the next one. On to the Ford. Now hang on to your hats because here comes a bold statement. This is the best Ford we've ever driven, so it scores accordingly. 19. Sure. Less yeah. until the two and a half litre V6 comes out, then it might get a 20. Yeah. The Rover may look like a car your granddad might drive, but it really impressed us. It's actually a very good car. I think it's a very well kept secret that how good this car is to drive. So I think um, it's probably somewhere between the two. It needs a good 18. score. I think 18. Yeah, I think 18. Fair okay. enough. So how desirable is the Peugeot? Well, let's just move straight on then <laughs> yes, to the, exactly. uh, because it isn't desirable. Look how many reps chose it in our desirability test. Count them. One. It scores 13. Now the Mondeo. I think this is going to have the success that the Focus had when it replaced the Escort. And I think everybody that sees this car is suddenly going to sit up and listen and look and actually want one. It gets the popular vote with a fanatical 19. And the Retro Rover? It proved popular in Brum despite its pipe and slippers image. But we look forward to a hot MG version coming soon. It gets 19. 
practicality and the Peugeot's big on space but short on doors. Without a hatchback, it scores 17. But the five-door Mondeo... Look, it's got a huge, huge amount of space in the back where you can fit five adults very comfortably, as we see earlier in desirability. But the boot is enormous. It's big enough for two very athletically built presenters, I'm sure. That'd be us, then. No, that'd be me. <laughs> It scores a well-endowed 20, and the booted Rover, it pockets a highly equipped 18. Cost of ownership and the Peugeot? £19,820. A hell of a lot of money for a car that's so bland. With a cost per mile of 53.5p, it scores a middle-of-the-road 16. The Mondeo is so new it hasn't got a cost per mile figure yet, but for their promise it's going to be even cheaper to run than the old one. And with lots of extras as standard, it gets a well-packaged 19. Even with recent price cuts, the Rover's cost of ownership is still the worst here. At 56.6 pence per mile, it scores just 15. So it's time to toss up the figures and see which of our company cars will take the prize in this week's Driven 100. In third place and in need of a new image, the Peugeot 406 scores 62. In second place with a solid 70, the Rover 75. But this week's top dog is the new Mondeo and a massive 77. This is a monumental Driven 100. The new Ford Mondeo has got the highest score ever because it's an excellent, affordable, all-round package that suits most people's pockets. We've tried really hard to find fault with this car in all the tests we've done, and we couldn't, and that's exactly why it scored so well across the board. It's new, it's fresh, it's dynamic. It's quite possibly the best Ford ever. Hey, you two spent the weekend together in this new Volvo S60. How far did it go, Pen? About three and a half thousand miles. Yeah, but you didn't do all of them and I was stood out in the cold. But it looks like Driven was part of breaking an endurance record in this very car. Find out how we did it next week at 8.30. Well, our Motor Show special is nearly over. There's almost too much to see, but the show is on from the 19th to the 29th of October, so you've still got plenty of time to come and have a look. But if you can't make it, don't worry, because Driven will be testing the best of what's here in future episodes. Until then, we see you next week. Bye-bye. Take your hands out your pockets. Next week, we'll be crowning our car of the series, and Mike sets his sights on the record books.